Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. I am the CEO of Red Panda Data. For those of you that don't know us, we are a Kafka replacement for mission critical systems. Today, we're going to talk about removing implicit dead lock in with two phase processing in an asynchronous context. Um, these are the challenges that we face while building this storage engine at some limits, whether it's at the gigabyte limit per second or when pushing the storage engine to thousands of partition counts. We're excited to have you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex. I am the founder and CEO of Red Panda. For those of you that follow up, want to follow up with me after the talk, my Twitter handle is at Emacs Erno. I am uh, super easy to reach. Uh, feel free to also join the Slack and ask me questions about this particular talk. Today, we are going to talk about implicit deadlocking in an asynchronous context. So Red Panda leverages the CSTAR framework, as uh, a lot of you may know. It's the, the same underlying thread per code architecture that uh, SILADB uses. And when you switch into a fully asynchronous mode, what you, what you don't get implicitly, it, it's effectively back pressure uh, and, and implicit serialization. And so as a programmer, when you're starting to think about, hey, what's the thread per code architecture? How do I think about that? Um, everything becomes asynchronous. And so you have to build inside your code particular back pressure mechanics to be able to deal with out of memory errors or that sort of thing. So in a world where you have no uh, implicit uh, blocking, right? So, so where uh, making a memory allocation doesn't block or where reading from a socket doesn't block, where it's all just fast, the next real bottleneck in computing becomes memory allocation. And how do you start to think about your memory allocation, your, your you know, and, and also how do you divide that across uh, 100,000, excuse me, 100,000 cores is too many, but let's say 96 core or an I3E and metal instance in AWS. And so the way you do that is you have to implicitly start to think about, well, how would I divvy up the resources? So to, to dig right into it, imagine you have a computer and then you have three cores. You have core one, core two, core three, right? So one, two, three. And so the idea here, um, actually let's do four cores because it's easy. So you have cores zero through three, so four core machines, um, and then you have eight gigabytes of memory. And so the idea is that then you would have split it between uh, every core for two gigabytes. You can have many strategies here, right? So another an alternate strategy is you can use an idea of work still in or, or you know, memory shares, blah, blah, blah. But having an explicit memory uh, restriction allows then the programmer to start to build higher level primitives. This happens to be what Sistar framework does for the programmer implicitly. You can envision an alternate view of the world, even in a thread per court where, you know, threads would, would figure out how to cooperate to get chunks of memory. Um, then to, to do useful work. And then you would get into all sorts of very complicated mechanics as soon as you start to cross NUMA domains. But to keep the, the, the talk restricted to the idea of implicit locking, I wanted to set the context and understand that a large part of the complexities with uh, the, the, the concurrent and parallel structure is back pressure. And how do you make sure that that you know you don't run out you don't um effectively it, it, it's one of the biggest challenges actually in in asynchronous programming in general and so why is this the idea is that the programmer thinks in concurrency and you leave parallelism to be a runtime variable and so with that some of us have have you know de de dealt with futures and and so it's it's the same thing that sister brings in into the framework and so at its lowest level, CSTAR has a set of mailboxes on, on every core uh, is actually an N square number of, of mailboxes where every core can communicate to every other core explicitly with the network of a single producer, single consumer queues. Okay, so, so you start to consume work as a way of coordinating things. In the space of storage engines like Red Panda, you have to do some useful work. An example is you have to create a topic in, in, in the Kafka parlance, and then a topic is divided into partitions. And at some point, a, a user is going to tell you, hey, save some data. So how are you going to figure that out? And so to, to work through that example so that I can build up the intuition of where the implicit blocking comes into place is that suppose you have a request 
that comes into core one, right? So you have core one and then you have core two. And so there is every core will have to have some type of global uh, metadata. And so this global metadata is a partial view. It's not a total view. And I'll talk about how to, how to deal with this, right? Like you, you start to build in some of the complexities of, 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 the, of the problem domain. Uh, in particular, the, the threat core public uh, uh, or domain. Um, and so you have this global data structures that allow you to look up, hey, is this the right computer in the network? So you have a network of three, 10, 20, 100 computers, and a request will get to one computer. And you have to determine at that computer, <laughs> am, I, am I the right uh, uh, computer to, to respond to this request? Let's say someone is trying to write to a click topic or, or or an impression topic. So your job is to compute the click-through rate for an ad tech uh, network. And so you look up this global data structure and you determine, am I the right core to handle this? And so to make it real and specific to Red Panda, uh, which is, is, it's a new storage engine uh, uh, with, you know, it, we have, uh, it, it's built on top of Raft, it's built, you know, in, in, in C++, and we give the programmer extremely high level primitives like partition topics, uh, transactions, you know, actually multi-partition transactions and so on. And so a user says, hey, write uh, this key value store. And so uh, this global data structure is going to say, I'm not the owner. Um, the owner is core two. So somehow, right, somehow you have to send the message to core two and then core two has to then respond back to uh, to this to, to the TCP connection, right? So you have a TCP connection here, and this would be your average Kafka client, right? So, so you have Liberty Kafka, AppStream Apache Kafka, your Python Kafka, it, it doesn't really matter. But from the point of view of, of the programmer, you're sending one computer a write request. Internally in Ethereum Core, we do this handshake. And so uh, this is where the implicit locking will start to build, and I'll give you the intuition, and then I'll dive into two particular examples. Remember that every core looks roughly the same. I mean, they may have particular different cache metadata of, of the global view of the world, but largely it's the same core. And the reason for this is as programmers to, of the storage engine, right? So Red Panda engineers, we built with a concurrent model in the world and we let parallelism be a runtime variable. That is, you can take Red Panda and run it on a single core, or you can take and, and you know put it on an IoT ed edge device, let's say a payment network, and, and you're trying to transact credit card fraud and you want to do local login, or you can take the same binary and put it on a 96 core VM on, on, on Amazon or a 225 core VM on Google, right? And so the, the parallelism is the number of simultaneous execution units. And in this uh, idea, it's, it's, the, it's a P thread, right? So like we're talking Linux, uh, and, and so you have p-threads, uh, that largely, <laughs> um, that's what it's about. And so you divvy up the memory and now, and now you have the program that looks roughly the same on every core. So how do you start to coordinate so that the right core in the Kafka topic partition models, and for those of you that are not familiar with the Kafka topic partition model, a topic is an unordered collection split into ordered collections of partitions. A partition is a totally ordered collection. Right, and so the mental model again is, is you have topics and topics are divided between partitions. And really at the, at the lowest level, Red Panda doesn't really care what a topic is. It only cares about partitions. Topics are just a human mental model, part of the Kafka protocol. But from the point of view of a storage engine, what we care about, what's the name of space and what's the partition count. Um, at the end of the day, that's the only thing that matters. Whether you have additional metadata that says you belong to topic clicks or topic ads, uh, as a storage engine, we don't care. What we care about is, is, is actually the, the partition count because that has meaningful uh, differences. For us, we have a single reader, single writer per partition. Okay, to continue the talk, um, th this, this talk track here where we uh, started chatting about the implicit locks. The fundamental intuition comes from this, this partial view of the world, which is when a network request comes in on core one, but the worker of the, the, the thing that is going to actually save the data to disk or read data from disk is on, is on core two. And there are actually many, many such kinds of requests. An additional one would be metadata requests, like do I have ACLs? You know, who's, who's the, who's the uh, a core that is partitional for the ACLs for this particular user account? Or, you know, topic metadata, or, you know, there's like a, a 
huge amount. Actually, Kafka has about 144 APIs. If, if you if you count them unique as as an API times versioning modeling, uh, not counting flexible uh, uh, protocol parsing. But anyways, so you have this this huge amount of APIs, and we've split the the code in in this logical units called you know a thread. Yes, so a p thread. <laughs> so what happens then is because you're trying to not um you invent this idea of a semaphore and like, I mean, standard CS 101 semaphore, right? So you have a counter and, and, and when you reach a, a certain amount of time, then you block, right? And that is the intuition that you have to build in a fully asynchronous programmer. If there is no back pressure, then the programmer has to build back pressure, has to invent the mechanism to put back pressure onto the system. Otherwise you're going to, there's basically no two ways about it. Either the programming language and the environment will block for you or you have to block. The nice thing about you blocking is that you get to control how you do you block. You know, do you allocate 30% to network requests and 70% and to, to cash and, and this and that. And so we want that kind of low level uh, manipulation of resources. So when you have a semaphore and you say, well, you know what? On core one, I'm gonna allow 5,000 concurrent units on every core, right? So remember that every core looks the same. So the implicit blocking comes where you can have a request that consumes all of the 5,000 units for, for a particular request. In the case in which we were built in was actually partition count, where core zero would dispatch a, a network of requests to n cores, and then you know it was like a scatter gather, and then it would get back the request of n results. So core zero would be exhausted in terms of its resources. So if at the same time, you get a similar kind of request on core n where it also needs to request um, uh, uh, resources from from core zero right so remember that this is all happening in parallel and so what happens is that they're both exhausted and they're both just waiting for it like it, it's it's a deadlock and so the first thing that you have to do if you haven't built it into your lock-in semantics is for every semaphore, put a timer. I mean, really, it, it will save you. It will get systems unblocked and unstuck. And I would rather have a system that has terrible pathological performance that has a minute of, of locking time, but but it doesn't crash, then, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a permanent thing or like whatever, 30 seconds or whatever it is, then, then, uh, then you know, sort of have a perfect system. And some of these things take a long time to, to come together. For us, we discovered these things where we were pushing the boundaries of hundreds of thousands of partition or 10 plus gigabyte per second workloads. And the fundamental differences between Red Panda and a database is that streaming systems often tend to see 10 to 100 times more traffic than, than databases. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a simpler system. We don't have as much <clears throat> sophistication on the indexing or metadata querying. Um, and so really people use it as a backbone for inter, inter uh, exchange between applications, right? like co coordinations in a way that gives you ACLs and, and you know, uh, whatever, um, audit login and permissioning and authn and authency and a bunch of other goodies. So anyways, so the implicit lock in here and the fundamental problem we're trying to solve uh, is, um, is, is this, is this two way lock in where, so you have two TCP connections, one, um, Right, so you have one TCP connection here and, and the other TCP connection here. And then they're both actually just waiting for resources. So the system basically locks up and 30 seconds or a minute later, the system and unlocks and you're like, I have no idea why the entire system just blocked for, for 60 seconds. Um, and so that's why. So how do you deal with that? Basically, the, the point of this talk is to highlight a two-phase mechanics that we've learned and, and I can give you four or five examples of different subsystems, but it's the same, it's the same pattern. And so when you get a request that would exhaust this 5,000 units uh, to go through this example, what you do is you borrow this 5,000 units for a fraction of the time. And so you break into submit and then, uh, and then you have a polar mode um, that gets back the data. And actually polling is a bad way of describing this, but it'll build the intuition if you've built any sort of network driver in the, in the past or any RPC framework. And so, so you get a request um, and there's 5,000 units, you consume them only on the, on the submit and then you give them back. And so what it is, is instead of, of holding for the entire request duration, you say like, I'm gonna hold these units just for the submit. And then what it is, is you're building effectively a credit system where you take, you know, you take 5,000, you drain them to zero, 
you submit it to the other cores, then every core has a fraction of resources consumed from their internal resources, right? Because you, you have to keep account of these things. And then you give back the 5,000 units. So core zero is able to process the next request, which by the way, would have totally known overlapping resources. One may be metadata, the other may be actually for data, or one may be for permissioning system, the security subsystem, and one may be for the metadata, right? Like that there are 144 APIs. And so a lot of them are non-overlapping in, in fact. And so then what happens is because Sista already has a poly mechanics, then you can piggyback on that idea and say, hey, after every now and then you suspend the future that, that made this request, you, 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 you literally like just don't respond to it and then the future just stays suspended. And then when you gather all of the requests, right, when, when you get the signal from all of the requests, then, then you respond to the TCP connection. Uh, and then, you know, this is basically the, the two-way handshake that I want to, to talk about in the beginning of the talk. This is the first part, and then this is the second. This is the second part. Now, why is this a general technique, and actually, how do we think about this in a in a much more sophisticated way? So, instead of polling, the idea is that on a busy system, you're going to have you're going to have this uh, uh, this cores, right? Say core, core one and core two at all times busy and communicating with each other, right? So I assume 100, let's say 50,000 partitions and, and let's say 500 megabytes per second, right? So, so any, any, any meaningful traffic, even at a megabyte per second, you should be able to do this. And then we have timers for, for, for uh, that, um, for the pathological case. So because you're sending data back and forth, then the intuition is, hey, instead of polling, what if I piggyback metadata on the other part, right? So every time now that you send the request, you can attach metadata, think of it as a void pointer, so that on your way back, you can answer different requests for other parts. And so in, in every asynchronous system, there's always some form of ID because you need to keep track of it, right? And so you, you insert this ID on a map somewhere, say an RPC ID map, and you say, I need to respond to this data. And so instead of doing, I send you, right, the, 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 the submit part, so we go back to this, and instead of saying, hey, I, um, I, I submit uh, the request and then I'm polling as a very, you know, it's like two very formal parts of the protocol. The poll could be lazy and it could be piggyback. And then the last part of this thing is that you built a timer to solve the pathological use cases. So with this idea, we were able to uh, increase the partition count in Red Panda from 40,000 to hundreds of thousands of partitions. And we were able to actually push and continue to push the boundary of, of throughput while keeping a relatively good latency. And the only real protocol that was exercised here was really just a different accounting on the semaphore, right? Remember, like you can only go as fast as the hardware. And so the idea is like, how do we remove this implicit deadlocking? And with asynchronous programming, it's incredibly easy to build this two-way locking mechanics in the world of a threat per core architecture where every core looks the same. And so if you've taken the mental model that parallelism is a runtime variable and concurrency is a programming structure, then you will land in a similar situation when you start to push the limits of this back pressure that you've built into your programming model. And so to summarize it, you have basically three quick techniques. So you, you break up, right? So, so the first part is that you break up uh, into submit and poll um, the, the APIs so that you could do fractional credit system as opposed to a full credit system. The second step is, uh, is that you piggyback, I think that's how you spell it. You piggyback on the way back from the originating core. And so you, you make this, uh, the poll lazy. Um, and then the third time, the third part of this technique is that you set up a timer for the pathological case in which for some reason, all of the work is going to core one and then core two needs to do something, right? And so you set up a timer that says like, uh, I got one request a long time ago, but I haven't received any requests from core one. And so there's no way to lazy piggyback. So you built a timer to disambiguate. And then the last one, which is a real bonus is that if you're setting up a semaphore, my recommendation is to always set up a, 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 a semaphore that has a deadline. Um, and there's very cheap ways of building clocks that aren't attached to the wall clock. So you're not, you know, you're not polling the system for, you know, system get time. And, and it's a very expensive, like 50 nanoseconds per call into the kernel. Um, so you can build very cheap timers because the only thing that you care about is monotonicity, right? So like making sure that the timer is 50 clock ticks or whatever. Um, 
with that, I'll wrap up this call. Thanks everyone for coming to my talk on removing implicit lock-in with two-phase processing. If you want to engage with me or if you have any questions, um, if you want to follow up, the code of all the techniques and tricks that I talked about in this talk is available on GitHub. Um, and so you can go on and look at the code and actually see the commits if you want to get a richer history of what happened and how we made this possible. Um, also, easy to engage on Twitter if you have any questions about this particular talk. My handle is at Emacs Erno, or you can tag the company at Red Panda Data on Twitter. Thanks for uh, the P99 conference organizing for having us. It's great to be here.